Nope. So then, let's uh, on with the show. Hopefully, you have lecture guide number one in front of you. And if you don't, remember to print these things out and bring them to class, as I said on the first day, or you're going to be completely lost here. I do not caption my slides. I uh, expect you to be able to look at the lecture guide, and I give you the names. But the lecture guides have all the names of the artist. Uh, all the key works of art that we'll be covering that day, the dates that I'm giving you. Those dates oftentimes, by the way, will be minorly different between the text and lecture guides and what you might see on the PDF files. They're always going to be within five years or so, so any one of those dates for an exam would be fine. Dates oftentimes change a little bit, um, and frankly, scholars disagree within five years or so on dates. If you see a date, though, that says, hey, Leonardo p painted this in 1580-something, and you happen to notice that he died in 1512 or something, you know that that's a typo. I, I think I've caught all those, but be aware of that as well. Along with the artists and titles of the works and the dates, you will also find key terminology on those lecture guides that I'll be re re uh, referring to periodically throughout the lecture. And so, again, having these things in front of you, printing them out, bringing the entire bunch to class so you can just say, okay, we're on lecture guide number one, uh, is something you absolutely need to catch up on if you didn't bring them in today. How many people recognize this? Yep. Have you ever, you know who the artist is? How many people are like, yep, know who that artist is? Know the title of this? thing. It's called the Vitruvian Man, right? Anyone wondered what the heck this thing is? Anyone know what it is? Yeah? Anyone else? Yeah? It's what we call a canon of proportions. And I'm not, I'm going to bring this back a little bit later. I just want to use this to kind of start us off with some big ideas here. We start off at the kind of high point of the Italian Renaissance. And while this class really is designed to start off with mannerism, the next movement, it never made sense to me to start off with a movement that's reacting against the thing that happened right before it, and to skip the Italian Renaissance, which is such an important moment in time, and set some pretty important ideas for art that artists will respond to in one way or another uh, over the entire quarter that we're looking at this stuff. So we start off with what's known as the High Renaissance. And the High Renaissance is a stylistic category. And a style, or a period style in this case, is something that you've got to get pretty familiar with here, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment. This work of art represents some of the key highlights of that style in that, first of all, it's uh, basically a method for showing you how to create the perfect ideal human being. And again, I'll come back to the specifics about this, but creating ideals perfection, beauty with a capital B, as I'll continue to refer to it, beauty that is universal and timeless for all people in all places, not a beauty that's in the eye of the beholder, but something that's seen as being universal, was a key goal of the Italian Renaissance. And we'll get to why they thought that was important. Another key component of the Renaissance that is in this work is that this work is actually an illustration of an idea that was written down by a famous Roman historian and architect by the name of Vitruvius, who happened to be the architect for Julius Caesar, among other things. And in that text, the Ten Books of Architecture, he said, here's how you create a perfect human being. And I'll, again, come back to this system in a minute. What I'm trying to highlight for you is why did they ever call it the Renaissance in the first place? What does Renaissance mean? What are the things we expect to find in terms of the visuals and the subject matter in Renaissance art? These are where we start off in this class, right? So right off the bat, what does Renaissance mean literally? Just shout it out. Rebirth, Rebirth literally. Naissance. Birth, rebirth, rebirth of what you want to know, right? What is it a rebirth of? The classical moments of the past. In particular, we're thinking about ancient Rome and ancient Greece. And here's, this is a tough thing to kind of get people to wrap their mind around in a very modern society, but we want to start 
when we're looking at these works of art, especially at the first part of this quarter, I just want to give you a really standard, here's a, a kind of three-part system of things to look at. I changed this at the last minute, so this should be three. Um, first of all, the first thing that we'll be looking at here every time is what is the historical context of a work of art? What are the th big things going on in the world, in the locale, in the particular church in which this work was created or for which it was created that had some kind of impact on the work of art? What was its context? This can trip up a lot of people right off the bat. I don't know how many times I try to explain this, but every, I'd say one in about seven will be all the way through the end of the quarter and not still understand what a context is. So a context is the idea that these, these works aren't made in a vacuum. That it's not just up to the artist to decide what they want to create. These artists, for the most part, through most of the class, are creating specific commissions for specific patrons who have specific things they want in their work of art. And the artist and the patron and the viewers are all part of a larger world that shares common ideologies or beliefs about the world. And those beliefs might be, or those things that impact the work might be, something as straightforward as religion, right? Christianity in this class. Or it could be the political system at the time that has an impact. Or it could be a huge event like a war or a plague or a you know, rampant disease. Or it can be something like at 1500, everyone goes a little bit crazy because they think perhaps 1500 is the, the end of the world and the last judgment's coming. Right? It can be anything that impacts or influences the way that an artist represents their subject matter or even the particular reason they choose a particular subject. And we really want to know what that is. We want to know what those factors are. And we want to be able to attach them to the way that the work looks. In other words, we want to say, because this happened, it had some kind of influence on this work of art, and here's how we explain that. So the context influences it. On the other side of that equation, though, you have to think of the context also as people who share belief systems and share common knowledges, who when they interpret the works of art in their own time period, have a shared kind of communal understanding of what those works of art mean. Every time period is different. Every group of people has a different understanding when they step in front of something. If we go, uh, most of us, if we go down to Mexico and we start looking at indigenous art, we might not have a clue what that is. We not, might not be able to make any sense of, you know, a, a, a Spanish soap opera or something like that. But you can bet the people of that society know how to interpret it. This is what we call a period I, right? Trying to bring ourselves back into the time period and think, what would they have understood by these works of art? Now, in the end, it's entirely impossible to totally establish what someone would have thought at the time period that we're talking about. In 1500, we're not going to get there. We're, we're not 15th, 16th century Italians. We don't know what their worldview is. All we can get is a kind of partial view, but we try to pay attention to that. We want to know that. We don't just want to say, here's what it means to me in the 21st century. That's not going to get us very far, right? It's going to be there. We're not going to be able to get away from it. We are products of our own society, but we do want to try to establish that period I. What would people at the time likely have thought of these works of art? And as I said, that context of how did it influence the work of art. Number two. These factors in the context, we believe, and we're starting off in this class, really kind of traditional, conventional art history, have an impact on the art to such a degree that particular works of art created during a particular time period in a particular location, geographical location, will share common visual characteristics in particular. And we call that a period style. Right? And you've all used style before, and you know what it means, 
But here we make it very specific. We try to draw out generic or general characteristics for works of art that were produced, for instance, here in Italy at the end of the 1400s into the beginning of the 1500s, because they are all products of the same kind of society with the same belief system, many of the same patrons, they will share common visual characteristics. And so a period style is an enumeration of those common visual characteristics and, frankly, what they mean. What do we expect to find when we look at the work of Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael? How do they share commonalities? For me, this is a good way early on in this course to get you to look really carefully at works of art, to say, oh, I see that. They're using analogous colors. They're using a balanced composition. They're using linear one-point perspective, right? These are things that we'll talk about here uh, in today's lecture. And that's what I expect to find in Italian Renaissance art. As you go forward in art history, you'll find ways to make this a heck of a lot more complex. But here we're starting just laying out a basis for you. Number three slash four on my typo up here is that we want to know all the other specific components of that work of art. We want to pay attention to things like its formal elements, right? How does this artist use line? What type of lines, which qualities of lines, what effects do those lines have on us, what types of colors are they using, what color combinations are they using, are they cool colors, are they warm colors, are they intense colors and saturated colors, or are they dull and matte colors and so forth. This also makes us look really carefully, but it's the, the very start to looking and analyzing works of art to say, that's its language. These are its letters. These are its words. They build up to sentences. And the overall work of art, when we put together the effects of the lines and the shapes and the colors, the spatial system and so forth, will add up to its statement, its meaning, its you know, message. Along with formal elements, though, we also want to be thinking about what is the subject matter? Why did they choose that subject matter? Right off the bat, we get a lot of Christian subject matter and a little bit of Greek or Roman mythology. And then later on, you start to see more portraiture and uh, a little bit more genre scenes, meaning everyday ordinary scenes. What does that mean? We also want to be thinking about what's called iconography and symbolism. Does anyone know what those terms mean? They're oftentimes used synonymously in early art history classes. Anyone ever come across the term iconography? I got an easy way for you to remember it. You know your desktop, you got icons all over it, what are those? Or your, your, your smartphone, got a little icon on there. How do you know when you push that button that it's going to lead you to whatever app it's going to lead you to? You're like, oh my god, I didn't know that there's going to be a test on the first day. This is confusing to me. Well, for mine, most of my icons look like the app that they're supposed to be opening. So if I'm trying to print something, I see a little thing that looks kind of like a printer. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's it. Click, right? And it prints something out. In other words, the picture looks like what it's supposed to mean. Iconography literally means picture writing. And iconography in art history specifically means the types of characteristics associated with particular figures, more often than not, or subjects that allow you to recognize that subject. If you've got a guy hanging on a cross, you're pretty sure, especially if he's younger, not old Peter upside down, that it's Jesus, right? If you've got a woman weeping at the feet of Jesus at the foot of the crucifix, and she's got really long hair, oftentimes red, maybe an alabaster jar in her hair. You're like, ah, Mary Magdalene. That's her iconography. That's what we expect to see with her over and over again. Symbolism is very similar. It's a picture or a object that stands in for an idea by a matter of convention. In other words, you look at a skull, you've seen a million skulls around, you're probably sure that means death, right? Death. There's something about death. And the cool thing about symbols is that once you learn their conventions, once you learn their meaning, generally speaking, they stay the same for centuries. You're not going to come across a, a skull later on. It means happiness. Go get, a, you know, go get a meal. It's fun times today. No, it's going to mean something pretty consistent. 
right? And then there's a whole host of factors that we just can't enumerate here about specifics, but we pick them up as we go along in this class and say, there's another thing to pay attention to, there's another thing to pay attention to, and so forth. Now, unfortunately for you, we start off today with a lot of context and not a lot of images. And if you're thinking this is just going to be standard, it won't be. I have to set the stage, and I'm going to run you through the context in uh, a lot of detail and uh, tell you why it's important and why we think it had an effect on the works of art. And then I'm going to talk to you about, in specific, a very complex idea, which is an aesthetic philosophy. In this case, Neoplatonic aesthetic philosophy. So you're going to get a little bit of philosophy here. So we start off here. We're in uh, Western Europe, primarily. Basically, uh, at the time that we start, late 1400s, early 1500s. So again, for those of you who haven't taken history for a while, we're talking about late 15th century, early 16th century. Uh, and we're really going to be focusing on these major areas, Rome, Florence, Milan, to a lesser extent. Now, we said it's a time period of a rebirth of classical ideas. Here's the classical world over here. You probably know that, of course, this is modern-day Italy, but it doesn't look like Italy much except for the boot factor, right? It's made up of a bunch of city-states that are constantly, by the way, in conflict with one another. The thing that they share in common is a history being Roman and a common language, but beyond that, they, generally speaking, don't really like each other oftentimes. They don't get along a lot. The, the Renaissance, which starts way back at the end of the, the, basically the 13th century, starts because of a big change in society that had been you know, festering for a while, let's put it that way. And that big change is we see, and this is key, write it down, the rise of the middle class, or rise of a middle class should be a way to put it. And it's not a middle class like most of us are middle class exactly. It's a middle class in the sense that it's a class that exists between the landed aristocracy and monarchy, who are people that were born into the world with their inherited rights and power and wealth and didn't have to do much to keep it, and the vast majority of the rest of the people in the world who were peasants or serfs. And the rise of this middle class, which I'm just giving you a schematic about, kind of goes like this. There are a whole host of people, I mean, actually, let's start here. During the Middle Ages, during the medieval period in Western Europe, the major way that uh, society was organized was according to what we call the feudal system. And I'm sure you've heard about this before, where you have that monarchy and landed aristocracy, and they are born into their wealth and power. It doesn't shift elsewhere, right? The next generation inherits their parents' wealth and so forth. They're pretty much the only people who own property. Vast majority of people in Western Europe are peasants or serfs. They're worker bees. They don't have any hope of one day becoming a aristocrat. Which is, by the way, by the way, why we have so many fairy tales that are about serfs somehow finding out that their parent was a monarch and now I'm an aristocrat. It's like, hey, it's all good. No, not going to happen for you. Sorry, never going to happen. In between those two, a very small group of people known as vassals. Those vassals could be knights, they could be property administrators, they're basically the middle management in the system that has to get the worker bees to do what the worker bees are supposed to do and take that wealth and make sure that it gets to the landed aristocrats who don't want to do much other than sit around drinking champagne and having fun. So if you live in this system and you're a peasant, what are you get, I mean, are you going to work really hard to try to become an uh, aristocrat? Is there any uh, you know, incentive for you to do much? And if you live in a world, and I know this is a gross simplification, but let's, let's not tell any medievalists out there we're doing this. In a, in a world in which, during the medieval period, the way that they tend to conceive of this earth and your life on this earth is that it's a bit of a testing ground for you to pass the test of being a good Christian so that you can get to the real goal, which is everlasting life in heaven. Now, it's not really that simple, but for the purposes here, just getting through it quickly, it's a bit like that, right? So you're not thinking about this world as particularly important except for passing those tests, right? Doing good deeds, 
being a good Christian, so that you can, in the end, get the payoff of going to heaven. After all, if you're a peasant, your life sucks. It's even worse than finals week here, right? It's a crummy, crummy life. Child mortality is horrible, right? Your chance of living a long and prosperous life, not a good one. You're pretty much saying, yeah, I just need to endure this, be right, so that I can get to this everlasting bliss with the angels in heaven and so forth. What changes there is that the vassal class, or kind of the middle management people, people who are basically setting themselves up as merchants, start to attain some wealth. And they do this through trade. And initially, a lot of those people are basically working for aristocrats, but they're thinking, hey, I'm doing all the work, and I've made all the connections, and it's my ingenuity. I'm just going to keep a little bit for myself. Then I'm going to keep a little bit more. And by the way, I don't need to work for you anymore. I've got enough wealth now. I'm going to go out on my own. And pretty soon they've got enough wealth that they can do the thing that really makes you a lot of wealth, which is they can open a bank or they can lend that wealth out and charge interest on it, which is the way our world works, right? Capital increases capital tenfold, hundredfold, millionfold. People who have that much wealth are always going to have that much wealth. It's going to quadruple itself anytime they want. It's just the way the world continues to work these days. Now they've got so much wealth that aristocrats are kind of coming to them and being like, hey, it wouldn't be bad if you gave me a loan. You know, I could use some money. My castle is breaking down or whatever it is. I'm making a joke here. But, right, they've got some power. They've got some wealth. And now they're looking at a world with a medieval view that says this world doesn't matter. And they're saying, yeah, this world matters. They look at this world and they say, this world matters in the sense that I worked hard for what I achieved. I merit what I achieved. You can merit that too. We should pay attention to those kinds of things. This world counts. I count. I matter. And then they start looking for alternatives. Again, this is a Really simple version, but it's, it's absolutely true. They start looking for versions of this kind of system, this societal organization in prior cultures. And they look back to ancient Rome and they say, yeah, man, if you went in the military and you worked hard, you had a chance to go further in life. If you were in Greece, if you worked hard, you had a chance to move up the social ladder. These are both societies that they saw as embodying what is known as humanism. Write it down, big term, humanism. The rise of the middle class fosters an interest and extension of ideas about humanism. Where, of course, the Greeks always said things like, man is the measure of all things. Greek sculptures are all about creating perfection. Those are ideal, heroic human beings. Their architecture is meant to embody the greatest ideals that they can get to. It's not about the glory of God. It's about the glory of man. It's about perfecting ourselves. We are all, I think, most of us, humanists at heart no matter how religious you are. If you grew up in a nice family that said things like, you can achieve anything you want to achieve, as long as you put your, you know, your heart into it, as long as you work hard, that's humanism. If your parents were really crummy and they're like, Johnny, you're never going to get anywhere in life anyway. It's, it's beyond your control. Society's set up to you know, take it to you. That's a little bit like the medieval view. So then think about this. If you live in a society that's interested in humanistic values and they're looking backwards and saying, what are the precedents, Roman and Greek precedents, it totally makes sense that they'll get interested in Roman and Greek history, Roman and Greek philosophy, Roman and Greek religion, Roman and Greek aesthetics, art, societal organization, governmental systems, and so forth, doesn't it? Now, the only problem is, how do you get access to it? How do you know about those things? And when the Renaissance starts, by the way, the center of kind of learning is way over here in modern-day Istanbul, in what was called Constantinople. This is the center of the Orthodox Church. The church had been split in two during the Byzantine Empire. Rome, by the way, at the beginning of the Renaissance, isn't even the seat of the church. The church is over here in the south of France because Rome is such a pit and so uh, unstable that they move it to Avignon. Right? So this is the center of learning, but what happens is that the Ottoman Turks start putting pressure on Constantinople. They're Muslim, 
And a lot of the Christians start moving out of Constantinople, and you know, somewhere around 1300, Rome's getting a little bit more stable, and they make the trek here, and they bring with them their philosophy, their texts, their art objects, and frankly, scholars, learned men, who share these interests. And that, in combination with this rising middle class, then leads to the fostering of this idea that this matters, humanism matters, and we're going to adopt art forms and philosophy in our art, and again, it doesn't happen overnight, that reflect or represent those types of values. With me so far, who's got a question? There's a lot coming at you at once, right? It's okay. It's really dark in here. No one will see you. You can sneak out. Yep, over there. Not all of it. Around 1279 or so, there's a lot of pressure for the Ottoman Turks. If you, if you guys don't know, when uh, Islam uh, and the caliphates kind of moved out, they would move into areas, but they weren't, as we hear today all the time, uh, really bad to the societies that they took over. They oftentimes would move in there, set up their mosques and so forth, and allow all the other religions to foster. But as Rome got a little bit more stable, a lot of people thought, well, let's just move to Rome. And so it's, it's minor migrations across into Rome. Not like everyone in Constantinople said, uh-oh, we're out of here. Although that does happen in the middle of the 15th century, right before our time period that we're looking at. Constantinople collapses. A huge exodus of people move uh, into Rome, or frankly, Western Europe, but Rome's the big center, Italy's the big kind of place to go. Good question. Yeah? Um, in the 12th century, when Charlemagne was king of the French, Frankish Empire, right. um, he introduced a lot of schools, so what's the difference between the education that came from the Italian Renaissance versus what he opened up in the monasteries? So that's a great question. Scholasticism is the answer to this, and it's a type of uh, educational system that's much more indebted to theological belief than what we're going to see here that takes classical belief. Although, with that being said, of course, everyone was interested in Aristotle under uh, scholasticism, too. So it's there. Again, I'm making this really generic picture, but if you talk to a medievalist, they'd say, wait a minute, the seeds for the Renaissance are actually further back. And then you talk to someone who's a Romanist, and they'd say, hey, it all starts with Rome. And then you go back further, and it just with historians, you know, you've got to draw these lines, but everything influences everything. Okay, so any other questions? General idea here. We've got the rise of the middle class. The middle class looks backward to Greece and Rome because they're both humanistic societies and that's going to influence them. The middle class, because they've raised themselves up by their own bootstraps, think that this world matters and that perfecting yourself is key. These are the cliff notes to what I just said. And that this is going to be represented in their art forms. And one of the ways that it's represented in their art forms is through their aesthetic philosophy. And this is not uniform to every Renaissance artist. But it's beneath Michelangelo and Leonardo and Raphael's art. And that's where we're starting here. So an aesthetic philosophy is basically the theoretical underpinnings of an art form. Why it looks the way it does. Why they think that what they're doing is going to achieve the result that they want to achieve. So in this case, you got to think that when these artists, and by the way, we're now in... You know, late 1400s, 1500s. So the Renaissance has been going on for a while. Some of you have taken 202 before know, you know, we've already had people like Masaccio. We've already had people like Botticelli producing their art, Perugino, and so forth. We're at the tail end of this. So these ideas are really set in stone. And when these, uh, you know, again, middle class patrons get interested in classical Greece and Rome, of course they love Greek and Roman philosophy. I mean, today, I think philosophy is a lost art, but most of you know about Plato. You just don't have a clue what he said, right? Is that true? You're like, I know Plato. He's a philosopher. He had to be important. Then I say, how many people know what Plato said? How many people are like, exactly? No, no, no. I mean, you got a bigger fish to fry, right? You got other things to pay attention to. How about Aristotle? Heard of that guy? Any clue what Aristotle said? Yeah, cool. So you're going to get to learn some pretty interesting things. And then you'll say, Oh my God, I see this everywhere. It's, a, it's in all these old texts, for instance, that I've been reading for everywhere, from anywhere. So 
The aesthetic philosophy, as you might imagine, the theoretical underpinnings of an art form is going to be very closely tied to the context. It's going to be linked to um, uh, you know, the big belief systems of that time period. In this case, humanism and the aesthetic philosophy of Neoplatonism or New Platonism, which is, just means Plato's ideas kind of extended into the, the present with various manipulations that have to do with Christian theology are going to be close. And the key here is that Neoplatonism or this aesthetic philosophy of the High Renaissance will explain to you why creating ideal works of art matters, what that's supposed to communicate. Go ahead and jot this down. I'm going to turn up the lights here for a minute. As you're jotting this down, I'll repeat this a couple of times because it's really important. It's the basis of classical styles. And a classical style is a trans-historical style, rather than a period style that's located in, in this case, for the High Renaissance in Italy, but at the end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century. Classicism, or classical style, starts with ancient Greece, gets revitalized by ancient Rome, gets revitalized by the Renaissance, gets revitalized by the grand manner and neoclassical periods in France and England, and it's still around today. If you walk down Greek Row, you see classical facades all over the place. You go to D.C., you see classical temples all over the place that are governmental buildings, right? It's everywhere. So at the basis of classicism are a whole set of theoretical beliefs that go back to people like Plato and Aristotle. And so if you never heard about Plato before, or what one of the key tenets to his belief system was, here's how it goes. And again, I can't give you all the ins and outs of this. We'd be here all day. But Plato wanted to make assertions that could be understood as universally true. If you never heard this term before, what we mean is objective truths. Truths that aren't subjective or a matter of someone's beliefs. They're just true for all time and all people in all places. Universal truths. Have you heard these terms before? Right, so it's the exact opposite of someone saying, well, in my opinion, this. It's when someone says, and we live in a world that tends not to believe in universal truths, or at least we're very suspicious of them for good reason. Because ten, they tend to be Truths according to someone's perspective that then you can't assail or you can't question, you can't criticize. Someone just said it is and you say, okay, that's the way it is. If you're staunchly religious or you know someone who's staunchly religious, right, they tend to believe in universal truths. God said it should be this way. And I'm not saying all of you. Nuanced versions of religion are quite different from one another, but that's just the quickest way that I can get to this. So he wanted to be able to say this is Let's start with the easy one. This is beautiful. And he wanted to be able to say that in a way that no one could assail it. No one could say, no, it's not. I don't think that's beautiful at all. And we know how this goes. Because, you know, how many different types of beauty are there? How many different people have you found beautiful? How many different, uh, if you point to a tree and you're like, oh, I find that beautiful. And someone else says, no, that's not beautiful at all. How do you ever come to a consensus on that? This was Plato's system. If you've ever heard of his allegory of the cave, that's what he's talking about. If you haven't, it goes like this. What do you have up here on the, st the front of the classroom here? What are these things? Chairs. Chairs. How do you know that they're chairs? You, you sit on them. Yes, excellent. That's one quality. They've got a seat. They've got a back. They've got legs. They share common characteristics, right? But do they look the same? Not exactly. Well, what does that mean for Plato? Why am I using this example? Well, for Plato, what he would say is, everything in this material or phenomenal, phenomenological world, the phenomenal realm, that we live in, our material reality, is actually not what you think it is. It's an imperfect reflection of a conceptual form, or what he called the eidos. And in this case, what he's saying is, these chairs are recognizable as chair because they all partake of the concept chair, 
or chairness. Right? So up there in this realm that is indeterminate, for him it's just this realm of the form, the eidos, are concepts that are immutable, that are timeless, that are universal. They don't change. There's just one chair. But down here on our earth, which is subject to our senses, right? Sight, smell, taste, and so forth, which are imperfect and fallible, you'll see these imperfect reflections of chair. This is the basis of classical philosophy. So then the question becomes, if you're an artist and you think that your art has to do with much more than just creating likenesses or entertaining, if you think, as Renaissance artists did, that art is a way to educate, that artists can bring you into contact with real knowledge, then if I create the world's most perfect painting of one of these chairs, is it going to be useful to anyone? And Plato would say no, because what you've just did is created a copy of what was already a copy and imperfect in itself, and what you should be doing is creating the ideal version of chair. The ideal is closer to perfection. It's in the realm of knowledge. It's in the realm of something that can teach or edify you. Now, I'm talking about chair, and you're probably like, he really he cared that much about chairs? No, he didn't care about chairs at all. He would be talking about something like beauty. And he would be saying, hey, there's a lot of beautiful people in this room, but no one's universally perfectly beautiful. You're all partaking of the quality of beauty that's up there in the realm of forms, but each one of you is imperfect. And therefore, I can pick the most gorgeous person in this class out and paint them perfectly, and it would be, for Plato, no good. It's an imperfect copy of what was already an imperfect copy. It's a little bit like if you do Xeroxes of a really good picture over and over and over and over again until it's mud and it's no good. That's what he's talking about. With me so far? So in Greek philosophy, they're not Christians, obviously. They don't have a one God. But what they think is that this realm of the eidos, the realm of forms, the realm of knowledge of universal values is absolutely something worth finding connection to. And they do it in their own art through various systems of proportionality more than anything else. Right? Greek sculptures are all set up with systems of proportions. Even Greek architecture is very rigorous mathematical proportions. They think that's perfection. They also think, and Plato said this many times, that if you create something that is perfectly beautiful, and again, I'm going to be using the term beauty with a capital B to say universal timeless beauty. Beauty in the realm of forms, not beauty that's subject to our senses. That that thing that is beautiful, such as a Renaissance sculpture, must also necessarily be true and good. This is based upon Greek philosophy. It turns up not just in Plato's thought, but everywhere else. They thought that Beauty or perfection has a moral dimension to it, called erate. In other words, it can make you better. Coming into contact with perfection can actually lift you up. And of course, it can lift you up through its knowledge of that perfection as well. This is what we call the platonic triangle. It's a simplified version of the graphic you just saw that says, if you want to, for instance, represent someone who's true, like Christ, he must be beautiful. You have to represent him beautiful. And he will also be good. Any questions on this? So this, for many of you, will simplify this. If I go back to this graphic, I'm going to let you write this down again. This is Neoplatonism. Make sure you had this. This is the aesthetic philosophy of classical thought. It's the basis of all Western kind of classicism in some way. Now, not all of them are this strict about it, but we're going to, again, in the intro course, I don't want to give you all of these complexities right off the bat. Let's start with this one. And while you're jotting this down, let me just explain this to you. If you're Christian, doesn't matter what your denomination is, 
every Christian believes that God is perfect, that he's infallible, that he knows what he's up to, right? He doesn't just willy-nilly do things. We don't know why he does things necessarily, but we know he's all-knowing and he's all-powerful. Does anyone disagree with that? So then, next, very rational thought here. If God created this world and he created us in his image, doesn't it just follow that this world should be perfect in some way, that we should be perfect in some way, somewhere, implicit inside of us, perfection? Right? He didn't just randomly do it. The problem is that when you look at this world, you don't see perfection. You don't see the ideal. But it's there. It subtends everything. Because God was the divine craftsman. He made this world. There must be something of his order in the world. Now stick with me. I'm going back to the Greeks again. Aristotle, in kind of, you know, historical argument with Plato, said, you know what, Plato, you've got this whole thing wrong. The realm of forms isn't right. The perfection that exists in this world is all around you, all the time. Aristotle, by the way, was not a theoretist. He was a empiricist. He liked to observe things. He liked to see how things worked and said, there's an order to the world. He's a little bit like a physicist, which, by the way, he loved. So most of us know that you know, beneath the appearance of things, there are all these physical laws determining how things operate. Gravity operates at a really ca- common, uh, in a common way, right? Or we can say things like, you know, anyone who's ever taken physics before knows these physical laws. Are you with me so far? And yet, when we try to observe these things, if I drop these two pieces of paper that are the same weight from the same height, they should do exactly the same thing if there's any order in the universe, and it's like, oh no. Never mind, didn't work, right? Except that a physicist would solve for all the factors, say if you did that in a vacuum, vacuum, it it would work. They'd fall exactly the same rate. That's what Aristotle believed. Beneath the appearance of everything, there is an order. You just can't see it necessarily. You have to derive it. You have to find it. You have to study it. Or another way to put this is like this, and it relates to this idea as well. How many people saw the Matrix series? You're into retro movies. You're like, that's a cool movie, right? You're with me? And those of you who haven't seen it, the premise of this movie is that the main dude, young Keanu Reeves, is living in a world that, as far as you can tell, is absolutely like the world that we live in. But over the course of the movie, he figures out that the world he lives in is actually a virtual reality. It's all just code generated. And when he comes into contact with that reality, he's like, wait, the real reality is the order or the code that exists beneath the appearance of this virtual reality that I live in. That's the way Aristotle thought of things in a way. That's the way Plato thought of things in a way, too. Except he didn't think the code existed underneath the world. He thought it was up there in the realm of forms. In this system, the difference is this. Because they're Christians, because they're all, you know, Beholden to these Christian ideas, they think that God's the divine craftsman. He created this world. There must be something of their perfection in there. They say, hey, I know how to rectify these classical beliefs that I now like, because I'm a humanist, with my belief system as a Christian. And they do it this way. They say, God is like Plato's realm of forms. In heaven, or the realm of forms, everything is perfect and timeless and universal. Nothing is changing. Right? And then they say, ah, but he's also like Aristotle, because because God created this world, there must be something of his perfection in the world, therefore it's in this world as well. Who's got a question for me? Let me add this, and then I'm going to let you talk to each other for a minute and ask questions if you have them. Traditionally, the mediators, so the people that show you God's perfection or his divine knowledge in the world, were the clergy. If you wanted to know, in, in, in as much as it was possible to know what you know, the divine mind wanted from you, you'd ask your priest. Or let's put it this way. The closest person on earth to understanding God would be the Pope. 
What changes is that during this time period, in addition to people with rational knowledge like scientists, physicists, engineers, and so forth, starting to amass knowledge, artists make the claim that they can also give you knowledge. And the knowledge that they can give you is a knowledge of God's order or perfection in the world. If you've ever heard the phrase that artists think of themselves as divinely inspired, as if God put an image or an idea in their head, it starts during the Italian Renaissance. What an Italian Renaissance artist is interested in doing, please write this down, is not creating a likeness of what the world looks like. They could care less what the world looks like. They want to create for you an image of a perfect or ideal world with ideal human beings in it, ideal spatial systems in it, ideal composition, ideal colors. Everything is ha has to be perfect. Because what they want to manifest for you in their paintings and their sculptures is not the world you live in. You can see that any day. They want to manifest God in the world around you. So that when you come in contact with a perfect picture, in addition to a subject matter that's saying, hey, pay attention to the crucifixion, you're in the presence of the closest thing to God on earth that you can be in proximity to. So I'm going to pause for a couple minutes here, and I just want you to take a minute to kind of, I know this stuff comes at you fast. We've got a lot of kind of groundwork we're doing today, a lot of foundational stuff. And if you're confused on this, you need to get clarification early on because these are the stepping stones to the next stage and the next stage. And if you're like, oh my God, I kind of understood what he meant by context, but I don't really know. Or I kind of think I know what he meant by Plato, but I don't really know. We're not going to go back over it a ton, and I'll just keep referring to it, and you'll, you know how that happens. So spend a couple minutes looking over your notes, thinking, and turn to your nearest two or three neighbors and share with them what you understand and what you don't understand that you might need clarification on. Okay? Okay, so who could use some clarification on something, or just a one more through on that idea? Yeah. Um, so I got how they were influenced by Plato, but how were the painters influenced by Aristotle's idea? So how were the painters influenced by Aristotle? Well, the short version of this is that Neoplatonism is this kind of 
cramming together of all these kind of early Greek philosophers with later philosophers and then eventually Christianity. And so the way that Aristotle gets in here is the idea that beneath the appearance of all things, there's order. And God created this world, so there must be order there. Right? So like Aristotle's beliefs, so Christian beliefs about God, the divine craftsman, creating this world. And while we don't see that order, it subtends the appearance of things. It exists beneath it. Again, it's like I was trying to do with the paper. You drop it, you, it appears like everything's just chance, random, and so forth. But then you get a, you know, a physicist to come along and say, no, the rate of descent under gravity is 9.8 you know, squared, and, da, 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 and you're like, oh, okay, there's an order there as long as you solve for all the X factors. Does that help? Yeah. Going back to humanism, are yep. we talking about man as a collective or an individual? Both. So, really good question. So, as an individual, humanism says try to perfect yourself. As a collective, it says as human beings, we should try to perfect humanity, right? And that starts with the individual perfecting himself and then trying to lift up others around them. So, for instance, in this case, humanists would say something like, and to make this very Christian, because they are a Christian, would say, God wants you to make yourself better. And he also wants you to make everyone around you better. And one of the ways you can do that, let's say, if you're a rich middle class patron of the arts, is by patronizing the arts to create these great works of art that can then be shown to other people to lift them up as well. Other questions? Well, remember, especially early on in the quarter, to look these ideas over a couple of times. Make sure that you can repeat them. If you're like, I think I've got it. And then if you test yourself by just saying, I'm going to write out a short summary, try to explain to someone who missed today in class of what Neoplatonism is or the aesthetic philosophy of classical thought is, and you can't do it, you need to ask some questions. Come see me in office hours or hit up the nicer one of us, Haley, right? Yeah, okay. Then the question is, the next one, of course, what is the period style of the Italian Renaissance? What are the visual characteristics we expect to find in Renaissance works of art? And here is, I won't do this every time, but I'll do this early on so that you can get this under your belt. Here are some of the common visual characteristics, of course, all of which start with the idea of that aesthetic philosophy, that ideals matter because if you create the ideal, you're creating the closest thing to God on earth, right? So in this case, here's what we say in general, not always, but in general, Renaissance artists are trying to achieve. This is the period style of the high Renaissance. Number one, ideals, God, beauty, truth, and goodness, they all go together. They all partake of the same qualities. Christians believe that God is perfect, he's true, he's good, he's beautiful. So if you create an ideal, as I said before, it is a reflection or a representation of God here on earth. And I shouldn't say representation, I should say it's an emanation, it's an embodiment. It's the closest thing to God on earth you can get. Two, unity. Christians believe, and people of this time believe, that a unified work of art is also godly, meaning that we're all part and parcel of God in the first place. But the easier way to think about this isn't theoretically, it's practically. It's to think, when a Renaissance artist creates a work of art, they think this way. They say, I'm only going to put things in this work of art that should be in this work of art so that all of the parts add up to one whole. Or another way to put this is, I don't want to fill this thing up with just anything. Like, I'm going to put this, it's a crucifixion, but it'd be kind of cool if I put a random crow over here in the corner. And wouldn't it be cool to have a little shell over here? They're going to say, that if they don't need to be there, don't put them in. Or another analogy, since we're in a writing course, is to say, when you get to writing your research paper, we're going to insist that everything that is in that paper is unified by the thesis of that paper, the meaning of that paper, the message that that paper is trying to communicate. Unity is the idea that, you know, if you're writing a research paper and 
you're trying to argue a point and you decide, hey, I'm going to talk about what Leonardo really liked for lunch on Tuesdays, we're going to say, no, that, doesn't, that shouldn't be in there. Right? That's not unified. The big ones are these, though. Rationality, clarity, and order. Renaissance works of art don't like, look like our world because they <laughs> submit this world to these ideals, to unity, and to rationality, clarity, and order, which are all very similar terms. Rationality means that it appeals to the mind, not to the senses. It's not meant to appeal necessarily to vision, or to taste, or to touch, or things that are fallible, things that are subject to, well, subjectivism. The rational mind in the Renaissance is the highest faculty of human beings. It's the thing that makes us closest to God. It's the thing that's going to allow us to perfect ourselves. Another way to put this is they don't like emotionality. Plato didn't like emotionality. He thought it was something that drew you away from this highest faculty of rationality. If when you were a kid someone stole your bike and you're like, I'm going to go punch him in the face, that'll teach him, and your parents said, no, you shouldn't punch him. You should stop and think about this. We'll deal with this rationally. We'll go talk to their parents. Those all go back to this idea. Or another way to put this is, and I'm sorry, there's no way around this, they're going to be creating perfect human beings, perfect women, perfect men, more often than men, by the way. And when they create these perfect men, that perfection is supposed to appeal to your mind, not your senses. Or it's this way. Right? How many of you have been out there in the world and you've seen someone and you're just like, this is, that person is beautiful, just totally beautiful, in an almost intellectual way. You're like, totally symmetrical, perfect spacing of the eyes, right? nice posture. You know that one? How many of you have been out there in the world and you see someone who does not match up to that at all, but you're like, oh, damn. You've been there before, just all sensual. And you're like, they're kind of weird looking, but I don't know what it is, right? <laughs> These works of art aren't supposed to hit there. They're not about that, supposedly. I'm not saying they don't do that. I'm saying, at least according to the way that they are theorized at the time, they're supposed to appeal to your mind, not your senses. How do you do that? Well, we're going to pick up what these things mean as we go along, but clear perspectival systems using linear one and two point perspective in particular that's in the intro to your textbook. Clear distinctions between a foreground, things that are closer to you, a middle ground, and a background, meaning when you look at a Renaissance picture, you'll see like here's the foreground, then space, here's the middle ground, then space, here's the background, and space. Everything's really organized. You can actually break up Renaissance works of art into the so-called Renaissance Law of Thirds, where everything is kind of in threes all the way through. Emphasis on line, or what the Italian Renaissance artists call disegno, design, disegno, rather than color. This is a tricky one. There's no reason, necessarily, that line, meaning strong contour line, should appeal to the mind, but they absolutely believe they do. And they believe that intense colors or very kind of washy, painterly surfaces appeal to the senses. So they'll try to stay away from that. Stable composition. Composition is a term that we use to say, how do the objects in the work of art get composed, right? How are they organized relationally to one another? And you'll see this over and over again. In Renaissance pictures, they're all really stable, really ordered, tend to be based on horizontals and verticals, like big T patterns. And why? Everyone stand up for a minute for me, if you can. Our existence in the world is on that axis. We're all vertical beings against a horizontal ground plane. It's really easy. It's not going to create any movement for you. Now everyone do this. Tip over to one side. Feel a little weird? Feel like you're off axis? Tip over to this side. Diagonals tend to imply motion. They tend to create dynamism in pictures. That's because when you look at things that are set up like this in a picture, your interior gyroscope actually does that. You don't do it in front of a work of art, but your interior consciousness does. You can sit now. Another really, really stable composition is a pyramid or triangular form. 
and there's no rules to this, but it's really simple. If the shape of the composition looks like something that can't get knocked over, like a triangle, it's stable. If that triangle is inverted on its tip, it's going to look like it's falling over and it's got all these diagonals implying movement rather than stability. Finally, balance and symmetry. Balance is the idea that there is equal visual weight on both sides of a painting or a sculpture. Asymmetry is there's a lot, uh, or symmetry is there's a, basically a mirror image on both sides. You've got a human being over here, human being over here. Balance could just be human being over here, building over here, right? And then there's asymmetry. We tend to be drawn to symmetrical compositions anyway, because most of animal life in the world is bilaterally symmetrical. It's really common to us. It looks correct. And these artists are going to be used it. So then back to this. How does this represent all of those things we just talked about? Right? This is Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. It's a page from one of his codices, so it's basically a page from one of his notebooks. And as I said earlier on, what you're looking at is an illustration from the pages of a book by a man by the name of Vitruvius, who was an architect for Julius Caesar. He was a product, this earlier man, of a very humanistic society. He was someone that's very closely related to Greek philosophy. And in these books, he said, hey, here's how you create the perfect human being. And the way that he explained this is that if you were to put a compass in the navel of a man with his arm stretched out to his side, that compass in the center of the human being would perfectly connect the feet and the outstretched arms. Or another way to put this is a human being's length of arms from tip of finger to tip to finger is exactly the same as their height. And the middle of the human being is their navel. That's how you create the perfect human being. Well, that's step one. Step two. How many people read the Da Vinci Code, by the way? All these ideas get stole there. Perfect canons of proportions, perfect Greek ideas about how you create perfection are all mathematical ratios. In other words, you don't just look around the world and say, well, that guy's pretty good looking, let's use him. Or that woman's great, let's look, use her. What you do is you submit that perfection to a mathematical or abstract system, such that, for instance, in this one, this guy's body is exactly seven heads tall. And that was the standard, seven heads to the body. Or you see those arms and those hands? The distance between the end of the wrist and the finger would be the same distance to the space between the end of that hand and the elbow and between the upper arm as well. And the same thing with the feet. In other words, everything can be broken down into ratio systems, about three point something to one over and over again. And sometimes people try to find the golden mean. doesn't really add up there, but it's very close to it. And again, this is creating perfection. This is an artist looking back to the classical past and saying, that's how I create perfection. The other side of the Renaissance that we haven't even gotten into yet is it's not just art, right? It's advancing what we would today call science or empirical investigation. It's about perfecting ourselves by paying attention to this world. And so many of you know that Leonardo started off, he apprenticed himself to a sculptor and a painter by the name of Verrocchio when he was 12, 13 years old. That's pretty common. You start, you know, somewhere around 8, 10, 12 years old. He worked with him until he was about 24 or so, and then he moved to Milan. And when he went to Milan, he apprenticed himself, or rather he he got hired by the family, the middle class family that basically ruled Milan, the Forza family. And you'll hear about these rich middle class families over and over again. The Medici family in Florence, the Forza family in Milan, the Esta fa family up near Venice and so forth. And when he went there, believe it or not, the way that he did his job pitch is he said, hey, you know what I can do for you? I can teach you how to build stronger walls to keep those Venetians out, for instance. And I can take down anyone else's walls because I know about 
hydraulics, and I can build a bigger cannon than they can. And by the way, I know something about moving water from the mountains into town and keeping it clean, and on and on and on. And then at the very end, he said, oh, and by the way, I'm a painter. Right? He was a true Renaissance man. He knew all these things. To understand human beings' proportionality and how we worked, of course, a lot of these artists clandestinely, because it wasn't okay for the church, would study the human body through dissections, which you're looking at here, knowing themselves inside and out. They did this both because they were interest in knowledge, interested in knowledge, but also because they wanted to create perfect human beings. And so this is a, this is a funny thing to tell people, but they would oftentimes draw skeletons, not Leonardo per se, but other artists after him. And here you see him studying kind of the skeletal uh, components of a, a leg and a hip muscle and so forth and all the tendons and ligaments that are in there. They draw the skeleton, they clothe that skeleton with muscles and tendons and ligaments, and then they put the skin over the top of that, and then finally they put some clothes over the top of that, just as a matter of studying the perfect human body. They figured out some things that are pretty interesting. Like, I don't know how many times I tell people in an intro drawing course that your head, your eyes and your head are basically in the center of your head, right? Does anyone know that? Yeah, of course, you've taken a drawing course, right? Where's the top of your ear? Everyone do this with me so I'm not the only fool doing this, right? Take your, if this is in the center of your head, move your, hand, your fingers back and where do your ears attach to your head? Hopefully right about where your eyes are, right? Halfway down, in between your eyes and your chin, is the bottom of your nose. A third of the way down, between your nose and the bottom of your chin, is the opening to your mouth. Another third down is that little cleft in your chin, and so forth. It's all proportionality, right? Everything's set up on these mathematics. The distance between eyes is oftentimes the width of an eye. The space between the eye and the edge of the head is actually a width of the eye again, and so on and so forth. And so they're interested in finding those secret little hidden, again, orders to human beings, to the world, because those were glimpses of God. And then they wanted to create works based upon that. Right? So studying the body, showing you, and again, mo many of you know, Leonardo came up with all of these inventions. Well, he didn't actually come up with them, believe it or not. He stole them from other people, and then he tried to perfect them. So finally, you're probably thinking, okay, art, yeah, here we go. I'm going to turn this over to you for a minute. This is a standard subject that you'll see a number of times in art. It's called the Annunciation, if you've never heard of it. This is Leonardo da Vinci's Annunciation. And again, if you're struggling today because you forgot to print out your lecture guides, don't forget for next time. It'll make it a lot easier for you. Print those out, bring them in. The Annunciation, and I'll always tell you what these subjects are. I'll give you a little brief overview, but I'll only do it once, and then you'll have to remember it the rest of the quarter, is an explanation for how Jesus Christ gets on earth in the first place. Many of you know that Jesus Christ's mother was Mary, or better known as the Madonna or the Virgin Mary. And the story here is that at the ripe old age of 14 years old, an angel visits her. And that angel's name is Gabriel, who has been sent by God, the Father. And the angel Gabriel comes to her and basically says, Hey, are you ready for this? And Mary says, I am ready. Now, I want you to stop and think about this some. It's not a good way to test works of art, but it's a good way to kind of get access to what's being shown. Imagine you're 14 years old. You're just minding your own business, reading the Bible, which, by the way, isn't a book form yet. All these things are anachronistic. It would have been a scroll. She's definitely Jewish to start with and so forth. You're a young, virginal woman, very, very pure, and an angel shows up in your dorm room or wherever you live. And says, hey, by the way, guess what? Are you ready for this? And you're like, ah, what? And then you're preggers. That's it. Bang. <laughs> what? How am I going to tell mom? Now, the reason I bring this up is, how does Mary respond to this? How does Mary respond to She's never seen an angel before. 
What's her action here? How is she responding? What does she look like? Why does the artist represent it this way rather than another way? What if they represent it the way that I just joked? What if Mary's like, holy shit, I'm not ready for this, right? No, I'm out, right? Let me think about it for a minute. This is big stuff, right? That would tell you something about that society. But in this case, what happens? Angel Gabriel shows up. Hail, most favored one. Lord be with you. Are you ready to be the handmaid of the Lord? Yes, I am. What does it tell you? Well, the first thing it tells me is, this is a really rational response, isn't it? She's not getting emotional at all. This is big news, and she's just like, no problem, got it. Rationality, part of the Renaissance. Not a very, let's say, Baroque work, as we'll see later on. Another thing I want you to see is some of the stylistics that we talked about here before. So we said rationality, clarity, order, and I started pointing out some of these things, unified composition and so forth. Everything meant to be ideal. Well, let's just point some of these things out. This isn't a huge work of art, but it's a good example. Very early Leonardo. First thing that I see right off the bat is that this artist is clearly establishing a focal point an area of emphasis. Look there, look there. We call that a focal point. He's organizing the space, in other words. Say, look here first, then look there. And what happens is, you might look initially at Gabriel over here, but because Gabriel looks and points over here at the Virgin Mary, and because the Virgin Mary takes up all of this space, she's bigger, she's going to be something that we focus on. Pointing gestures, looking gestures, are what we call implied line. They're ways to move us around a picture. They're not a real line. They're the line that happens when I say, look at that wall. And you see an imaginary line between my finger and wherever it's pointing on that wall. Or I look somewhere, and you look to see where I'm looking. Or the corner of a building points somewhere, or what have you. Implied line. Then I notice that Mary's turned towards me. This gives me more access to her. It makes her more interesting. If I gave my whole lecture like this, right, not so good, even worse. Super bad now, right? But if I do this, you pay attention to me. I notice this all the time. If I walk around and get in front of you, you're like, oh my God, something's going on, right? Energy. That's what's happening there. But then you're going to look, of course, between these two figures, back and forth, back and forth, know the story. He's got cool wings, by the way. And you're going to see this in the middle of this. We're going to come back to this. This is some kind of weird-looking table on which she's reading this Bible. It's to show you she's, you know, again, very holy. And you'll notice the organization of the space again. If we split it right down the middle, down this tree, by the way, balance, balance. Lots of trees, one figure, Mary composed against this background that, by the way, because the high lit body stands out, makes her show up more, balances the picture. Remember how I said foreground, middle ground, background? Well, there's your foreground. Then you've got nothing, a big wall. And then your middle ground, these trees, which by the way, are, do those look ideal? It looks like Disneyland trees, someone out there pruning these trees for you. And then you've got nothing, and then you've got deep background. Then what else did I say? Linear perspective. Linear perspective is the use of a system in order to give you perfect space in which you have a vanishing point somewhere in that picture, one point along the horizon, and all of the lines that are basically parallel to that are going to recede to that vanishing point. You can find this in the first chapter of your textbook. So in this case, if I go back here, see all these lines? of the edge of the architecture, they're all receding to the same point. Now the point of that is that that's not the way the world looks. Linear perspective, although a really cool technique to use to create the illusion of three-dimensionality on a two-dimensional surface, is perfect, rational, mathematical space. Everything in this picture will recede back to that point. Now let's end with a couple of things here, and we'll bring this back at the beginning of class uh, next week, which is this garden, all of that foliage, by the way, biologi or biologically accurate because he was an uh, amateur botanist, is a symbol. When you see the Virgin Mary here in a garden, 
with lots of flowers. It's what we call a hortus conclusus, or enclosed garden. Again, a term on your handout. H-O-R-T-U-S-C-O-N-C-L-U-S-U-S. And that is, it's walled off, meaning closed like a virgin, but fertile nonetheless, like the Virgin Mary. Right? That's the trick. The miracle of Christ's birth is that she was a virgin when it occurs. That's why Christ is so important. Another symbol, though, is right here. That looks suspiciously like a Roman sarcophagus, which is an above-ground casket. And if you're wondering, well, this is all about birth. Why do we have death in there? It's because they include little symbols of death along with early scenes of either Jesus as a, you know, as a little kid or in annunciation scenes to point to the whole reason he's born. He's born so he can die, so he can sacrifice himself for us. And in art history, we oftentimes call this Alpha Omega symbolism, the beginning and the end. Christ said he was the Alpha, the beginning, Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, end, and here we see it. It's a coupling together of something referring to his birth and his death at the same time. Now, there's more in here, but we're out of time, so I'll talk to you about it next week on Monday.